Welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor, and uh, forthcoming at some point today, the great Tom Scioli should, uh, should, should join the proceedings, having some technical difficulties on his end. But, uh, you know, when I say we're going live at 7 p.m., we're going live at 7 p.m., can't leave you guys hanging. I uh, hope you guys are all doing super well. Let me bust out the uh, chat and see what you guys are up to. Uh, what's been happening on my end lately? is uh, I, I finished the production part of my uh, next comic. Uh, so I finished all the drawing and it's just all technical stuff that uh, is being done right now. Computer work. My fucking face is stuck to the computer monitor uh, at all times. So it's alleviated a little bit of free time to have a chat with my buds and reach out to some homies and, 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 and do some shop talk. That's what the, the streams have been the past couple of days. And I'm going to extend that for a little while uh, until, you know, I get severely bogged down again, but I like, uh, you know, this is a, this is a channel. It's not a show, you know, cartoonist kayfabe is a YouTube channel. Uh, so we have all these spare hours uh, that we can put some fresh stuff on there. No, no reason to bottleneck it on, uh, on, you know, our Thursday record sessions and doling out one video a day. So reached out to Tom, was super excited to, uh, you know, check in with the dude, see what the hell he's up to and uh, get some updates on which man and some of the comic stuff that he's got going on lately. It's been a while since we've uh, connected with him. Yeah, this is something I always like to do uh, in the chat. Let me know where you're uh, streaming from. That'd be a cool thing. Uh, Jimmy and I were on the road to 100,000 subscribers, so hit the uh hit the uh, notification button so that uh, and become a subscriber so that we can deliver these videos that we make to you promptly including these kind of impromptu streams i never know who uh i'm going to be streaming with until sometimes hours uh, ahead of time uh and hopefully hopefully tom gets his stuff together man so that we could make it happen because it's been a long time since uh since we connected with the dude yeah, Rob McCalla, man. I'm so sorry about what the hell's been happening with you. What 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 time is it in uh in Scotland? Because if uh, for some reason Tom Tom fully bails, which which may be the case, maybe I'll send you a Streamyard link, man, and and uh, we could have an impromptu Rob McCollum session. Some of the photos that uh, you were sending me were uh, pretty pretty wild. And if you're connected with Rob on social media, you'll see these old photos from like 1990. It's Rob. It's young Frank Quitely. Mark Miller and uh, Grant Morrison. Pretty freaking cool. Jason, thank you so much for that super chat. Grateful for everything uh, Jim and I do. Uh, well, guess what, man? We just barely got started. Uh, we're, we're super stoked to continue to bring you high quality vids. Uh, we got uh, some more Eastman Laird coverage coming uh, to you probably Friday. And uh, Jimmy and I, we have a recording session set up early in the morning uh, to tomorrow. So once once I kill this stream, I'll put the sort of prompt for the morning weekly stream that Jimmy and I do uh, so that you guys will know when that's uh, come in and you'll have a URL for that thing. Uh, slowly but surely, Jimmy and I are figuring out the, the technical aspects of, uh, of YouTube and the different apps and things that are available to uh bring bring uh stuff to you tom says talk to you soon now that could mean several things can it not uh that could mean i'll talk to you some other day or uh that could mean that i'm logging in one of the great frustrations of texting with a lot of people is that sort of communication let's see Let's see. Talk to you soon. One second. Meaning you're coming into the chat. Or we'll reschedule. We're operating without a net today. And I think that that's a, a fantastic way to get some reps in on this public speaking shit. Not, not uh, something that comes very, very easy to me or probably to, to most cartoonists. You know, we sit around here all by our lonesome, uh, doing, doing our work and, you know, barely saying a word, uh, doing these regular streams that'll 
get a little exercise in on the public speaking. Oh man, there's there's Tom. Let's let's see what we got. I'm gonna add him to the stage. Everybody, cross your fingers. Okay. Can nope. you hear me? I can do hear I, you. Great. Sound good. Okay. Awesome. Fantastic. What do you think happened, man? Like, uh, how, how do I understand? How can I hear your audio so much easier now? Well, it's a different device. It's um, wired in headphones. And uh, my wife was watching Friends. On, she was streaming that shit? On streaming on, on Max. I, I told her to shut down all the streaming. She didn't think that was going to count. Go, so I turned it off. Go go get her in the room. I have to, I have to talk to her. Get, get her on the stream right now immediately. <laughs> She's busy. <laughs> Tom, there are 150 people here waiting for you, man. Uh, yeah. Let the people know how you're doing. I'm doing great. I, I'm, you know, keeping busy and and feeling good. The the spring is on its way, and so, the sun's starting to come out. I'm I'm, I'm starting to wake up. <laughs> yes, uh, and maybe we should even let the audience know that uh, it's a very windy day. You know, it's very seasonable. It's nice. Uh, well, I think it's actually starting to get cold again, but it's very windy, and uh, the. Duquesne Light Company are the people responsible for our electricity in this town. Uh, could go down, it's very finicky, old technology, man. So, if we just flat out cut out, that's the deal. That was the problem. Tom, it's good to see you, man. It's been way too long. It's been a long time. I was trying to think because, like, I gave Jim a copy of uh, Jack Kirby's Star Warriors because, yeah. like, I had to go over his house to pick up. Uh, some stuff for for something that I don't know if it's been announced yet or not, and uh, so I, I gave him a copy there, and then I, I have a copy for you, but I haven't seen you since then. So that was like September, I think. Right. I, th I think the move might have been uh, give give Tom, I mean, give Jimmy two copies, and then we could have did a video on it. You know, hey, <laughs> you guys will just have to <laughs> lean over each other and read it together. <laughs> yeah, man, we just had a uh, we had a, a death match with a box full of uh, Dave Cho stuff. On nice. uh, on Thursday, he he went through his archives and was like, "I just have one of this, one of that." Uh, you know, these things are fifteen, tw almost twenty years old. Some mm -hmm. of them are twenty. Like he he got the uh, Zurich when you got the the Zurich. Same he, exact year, I think. Yeah, totally the same exact year. Yeah, they they would do two rounds of Zurich uh, mm -hmm. announcements, and he got he he was part of the winter announcement. Okay. And then you were part of like, what was it? Summer or, or summer. Okay. Fall? That makes sense. Yeah. Cause I don't remember. See, I mean, like I don't have a memory of everybody who did, but I don't remember seeing his, but do you remember some of the guys? Time ago. I do. Um, Jason Shiga was one. No. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then like we sent each other a bunch of stuff, you know, like you'd look at the other guys and then you'd send each other your books. So I have books from uh, uh, other winners that year and you know, they have my book. So that's pretty cool, man. Uh, can you, can you let's talk about that a little bit, dude? Uh, was that the first time that you submitted to the Zurich? That was the first time I tried. Yeah, I, I heard uh, David tried like seven times. I think he said before he yeah. got it. Yeah, I think he said like four, but oh, okay. regardless, mul multiple times. Yeah, multiple times. Yeah, it, and it was. I mean, I had a lot of help. Because, like, and again, it was something that I was hearing about from other people in Pittsburgh, and then I was like you know, talking to them, you know, like, okay, what should I do? What should I do? And then I, and I talked to Wayne Wise, who also, like, I think he won, like, one of the first Xerix or whatever, and I talked yeah. to him. So I got, I had a lot of good information going into it, you know, how to how to approach it. Right. Uh, explain some of it, man, because, uh, you know, I, I was a little too young to, to have the privilege. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the main thing that they're looking for is, like, a clear explanation of like what you're gonna do with that money, like a clear timeline. And so like, I think that's a, the really big part. And of course, I mean, like the, the merits of the work are just sort of a given, but- um, So they're trying know, to kind of gauge your seriousness to, to yeah. make sure that like, okay, if we give you some cash, there better be something with some staples down running mm -hmm. down the spine. Yeah, that it's not just gonna be money down the drain. Cause I'm sure that has happened. You know, that's a question. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Laird uh, that next time mm -hmm. if they're if they're well, he probably wouldn't know because because he seemed reasonably hands off mm -hmm. with yeah. Him. I I didn't have any dealings with him. Like all all the people I talked to uh, within the Zurich, he wasn't one of them. Right. Um, I, I do wonder. I mean, I never I've talked to him a couple times at shows and stuff after this, but I never asked him like the the fact that it was like a Kirby imitation. 
Like, did that have a, because I, I, like, looking, I didn't, like, I knew they were Kirby fans. I didn't know they were as big Kirby fans as I know now. Right. And so I wonder if that was like, okay, yeah, we got to give this Kirby guy some money, you know? Yeah, you know, I, I, I can't, obviously can't answer that. But what I can tell you is that uh, in talking with Peter and getting to know him, he he knows your comic uh, yeah. because because of the the the, the Kirby aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So that's a yeah, cool it, it makes so much sense. Like I couldn't have. Uh, I mean, I was doing Kirby stuff anyway, but I couldn't have planned it better. So the the Zarek grant goes away whenever the proliferation of crowdfunding, you know, on on your own becomes a deal. Uh, Indiegogo, Kickstarter, whatever else is available, uh, and you just had a, a successful Kickstarter for for Witchman. What what is this comic? Yeah, I mean, it it feels like Zarek all over again because it's like it's kind of a similar amount of money, like adjusted for inflation and stuff, and and. Yeah, it's it's like the first time that I'm printing something like like you know calling up the printer and since eight opus like that was the last time I had to like deal directly with a printer and stuff. But it's Witchman. It's uh, like a golden age style superhero. I mean, it's a it's a modern comic with a modern aesthetic, but it's it's got like a golden age ethos of like anything goes of like just super um, archetypal. You know, like something where it's like. You know the first ten superheroes that people invented was like, okay. Uh, yeah, we got Superman, we got uh, Batman. Okay, Bat. Okay, how about a Hawk? We got Hawkman. You know, it's like out of the, it's like okay, Witch Man. Yeah, okay. It's like he dresses up like a witch and gets on his broomstick and you know fights crime. You know, it's it, it, it was kind of like that. So it's you know. I don't know if you saw our conversation with Matt Wagner, but he described the superheroes as working best from the time like their narrative value is best if you make the story around the time that the characters were created you understand so yeah so I, yeah i and i saw that interview and i thought that was an interesting point of view i don't know that i like 100 percent agree with it but i get it and uh when you know like even something like batman year one it obviously doesn't take place in the late 30s but it's it you know it is akin to it and the batman the animated series i mean they have computers and things like that but it does it has like a uh you know 1930s vibe so that's how this is too this doesn't necessarily take place in the 1930s but it's got uh dirigibles and stuff you know it's got all that kind of stuff but yeah, if somebody think, has to get on their their smartphone they can do that too i think that i think that was uh the question you know if yeah. if, if that sort of vibe uh, runs runs through your head now smartphones see that's a dicey thing because when you set up a story uh at a time before cell phones there's just way more dramatic possibility you yeah. know even yeah, uh, but, uh, yeah go ahead. like co comics especially superhero comics there's so much stuff missing there's so many gaps you know there's so much jumping around that it it's not as obvious like you know like in a movie it's like get out your phone get out your phone why aren't you getting like you know but there's not time for that in a comic in a comic you're just jumping on to the next thing so it's not like it's not like you're making a comic where there's like a bunch of scenes where it's like, oh, he's you know wandering through here. How's he going to figure out how to get? It's like he's going to be out of there in like two panels anyway. Right. <laughs> I uh, while I'm putting together the Switchblade Shorties comic, uh, it takes place in the '90s, and it's not like a specific year. You know, it's the '90s, so it could sure. have any number of uh, cool inventions that might have come uh, a, a little bit later. But there is one part like I had to put a nod to the idea of the cell phone. Uh, where there's this one part where the little rich girl, uh, you know, she's a silver spoons. I was thinking like Ricky Schroeder, like mm -hmm. as, as, as this chick, uh, she, she pulls out like from her tights, one of those like two liter bottle of Pepsi cell phones mm -hmm. and uh, is hitting buttons and they're out in the middle of the woods. And she's like, oh, this thing doesn't work, you know, just to put a nod to the cell phone, but yeah, also to acknowledge that, that the shit didn't work. Those phones are like famous from stand-up comedy because like everybody has their routine now where they pick up the the stool that they sit on for uh. for stand-up comedy <laughs> and they put it up to their head and then they raise the microphone to be the antenna. Speaking of which, man, today we lost Richard Lewis, one of the great greatest guests of uh, the Howard Stern show. Yeah, that hit me. Yeah, yeah, great. I mean, yeah, I remember I remember him on the Boku ads. You know, I, re <laughs> I remember seeing him on Letterman. And I mean, I was just a little kid, so it was like, here's my favorite stand-up comedian. Like he would always introduce him as like, you know, the best guy doing it. And then he'd come out 
and say a bunch of stuff that like I didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. But it was like, oh, yeah, this is the best guy. This this guy's the best guy. Do you, off the top of your head, do you remember the, the sitcom he had in, yeah. in, the, in the 90s? Any, anything But Love with okay, Jamie yeah. Lee Curtis. I watched every episode. So I loved I. it. Yeah, it, me like, too bombed instantly and uh and yeah like i just i loved them and then that around that time too like watching the channel nine show on stern uh they did like a happy birthday howard remote where it was like taped on the set of anything but love and then jamie lee curtis like pops in and she's like fuck you howard she gives them and they like they bleep it or whatever because he at around that time he he was a proponent of like the Jamie Lee Curtis conspiracy theory. And yeah, we know, he, we know it. Yeah. We don't even got to get yeah, into exactly. it in this, in this modern day and age. Stuttering John asked her that, like during a Stuttering John <laughs> interview, and her publicist is with her. And they said the publicist, and it's 100%, like the, the publicist made the same face that Lee Harvey Oswald made when he got <laughs> shot by Jack Ruby. And if you watch the tape, it is the exact face. Oh my so, goodness. Like but, that, that so, is yeah. how, how, you know, it sucks that that went down for her, Yeah, but for, uh, for sure. lucky it happened in the eighties and nineties, like before the mm -hmm. internet, yeah, before it could sure. be, be yeah. memed out and shit like that, mm -hmm. man. I got a whole archive of all the uh, channel nine shows. I've, I watch every now and then I cycle through them. It's some of the best TV ever. And I do think about it with, like doing YouTube shows, like doing the Total Recall show or whatever, like that that's the gold standard is Channel 9. Cause those guys had like $25 budget, right. you know? And they, they made magic, you know, they, they it, didn't, it didn't hinder things at all. It, it made it even better actually, so. So, so uh, which one of you guys is the uh, Billy West of the crew? <laughs> Billy West, that's the other thing. Yeah, like, cause that was my first encounter with Stern was that like the channel nine show so like billy west was just part of it so and he was pretty new at that like he had sort right. of showed up shortly before the channel nine so to me that that was like the galaxy of that show yeah certainly the best era in my opinion yeah which man how many pages and wh when are uh your your backers going to be able to uh, see this thing yeah a lot of stuff happening with it so it's 52 story pages and then there's even like a little bit of story on the uh inside back cover, the inside front, cover. like my stuff's chock full. And I just paid the printer. Like I just sent everything off to the printer and made like the, the payment that you have to make to get the wheels going. Yeah. And they're generating like the final proof. So I'll be looking at that proof and approving it. Like I already looked at a preliminary proof and, and then made all the adjustments I needed. So I should be getting those books um, by the end of March and then just start, you know, start mailing them out. So, and uh, the goal that I set in the campaign was June, like for people to get it in their hands, but it, it might even, might even get there before. But um, so that, that's wh where it's at. And the process was pretty interesting because like, I haven't done just like a regular comic book in a while. Yeah. And so I always forget, like I always miscount the number of pages. So like, I did it with the Jack Kirby Star Warriors book. So I had like, I'm like, oh man, I need, I got to fill two pages and then like magic starts to happen. So that's when I realized like, oh, I can put Cyclone Burke in there, Jack Kirby's like first science fiction comics. So it was like perfect. Like I wouldn't have thought to do that even, except I had these two pages to fill and it ends up being like this, you know, amazing thing to put in there. It was the same thing with this. It's like, there were a couple pages that I had done sort of early on, but never really found a place for in the narrative. So the book was going to go out with like, without like these two pages that I was pretty proud of thought were pretty cool, but I just had no place for them. And then it's like, oh man, I, I need two more pages. And then I'm looking, and then it's just like the perfect place for each of those. So it just, those weird things of production, the necessities of production kind of like help make, make your thing even better. Did you feel some stress? Like it, it sounds to me like the Kickstarter happened and was completed before you finished the comic. So was that a nerve wracking experience? No, and to be honest, that's like part of the process for me because I, I need motivation to finish a project. I don't need motivation to start a project, but I need motivation to finish it. And yeah. and I had during uh, the, uh, you know, whatever the, uh, what's it, COVID, like I, began and finished a bunch of projects, started and finished, started right, and finished. Yeah, that's and, right. then, and then I got to a point where like, it was like, why, why am I doing, like I couldn't motivate myself to finish a project. I could motivate myself to start a project. So it was kind of like, okay, people are waiting for this book, time to start. So I had like, I had maybe like nine or 10 pages of it done. 
And then once the thing was, it, you know, I started the campaign and was like, okay, let me do, you know, and I'm working my way through. And then when the, it was funded and finished, I'm like, okay, now let's buckle down and do this. So I was, just executed. Was which man one of those uh, COVID projects? Um, I mean, I was playing around with it during COVID, but I, I think, you know, I, I don't think I started like very seriously. It was just one of, it was like, yeah, it probably started there, but it, it got serious after. And I, I, and I have, you know, a bunch of them. So the next time I do one of these, I'll be, I'll be picking from that pile most likely. The audience is bringing up some, uh, a good question. Uh, w will there be a, a possibility of uh, people who didn't back the Kickstarter, will they be able to get copies of this thing? Uh, probably. I mean, I am overprinting, so I'm going to have them at shows and stuff like that and eventually like set up some kind of mechanism on my website to sell them. And then, um, you know, when I do a, uh, when I do another Kickstarter, that'll be one of the, you know, tiers will be like, oh, get the new book and get Witchman. you know, like it, it'll be part of that. And I mean, I, I, I'd like to get like a wider distribution too. It's just um, after you know, I kind of, it was this gap where I had like nothing really like going on. And then now I have like a job lined up. So I'm going to, you know, fulfill all this stuff for the backers, but I'm, it's probably going to be a while before I start like a larger distribution, you know, for this. Whereas if I didn't have this other thing going on, then I, I probably would just, you know, uh, fine tune my website and, 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 you know, set aside a bunch of time to like, you know, make some trips to the post office and stuff. So let's make you gigantic on the screen. Are you going to going to announce to everybody what this uh, next project is? I, I mean, I can't do the full announcement, but I can sort of say a little bit of it. Like, well, let's hear it. Okay, it's I'm just fucking with you with this yeah. camera thing. Oh, boom! Yeah, See, it's, it, <laughs> nothing like seeing I just your want, own I just, face. <laughs> yeah, like space balls. I just yeah. wanted to put you on the spot for a second, man. But yeah, yeah. get to it, man. Tell tell us every detail. And, yeah, uh, and tell us what was bleeped in some of those early uh, kayfabe videos we did. You know, your, your shoot interview number one, man, has the statute <laughs> of limitations passed uh, where you're comfortable uh, saying to the public, uh, you know, what we omitted from all those videos, including now, the if, Gerard Way one. Yeah, the Gerard Way thing goes to my grave. <laughs> never, <laughs> I'll never tell. But um, the, I mean, the thing is, it's it's probably no secret that for, it, it's probably for years at this, it might, it might even be for like three years I've been trying to get like a Godzilla thing going with IDW. And I did this like massive Godzilla uh, pitch. And it was one of my big pandemic projects because it was like, I had nothing but time. There was no, you know, so I just, I'm like, hey, I feel like making Godzilla comics. So I made some Godzilla stuff. And then eventually uh, Toho rejected that story. So that was maybe like a year or two ago. But since then I've been, you know, trying to figure out, you know, something, you know, like trying to get a different Godzilla thing going. So I got a Godzilla thing going. It's, you know, I've, I've turned in scripts. I'm doing layouts right now. It's so it's, it's been, uh, Toho loved it. They approved this, this new thing. So it's Godzilla. I'm not going to say what the elevator pitch is. I'll leave that for like the big announcement, but it's a pretty cool elevator pitch. Like it, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the elevator pitch. Well, you got to tell me of off the record afterwards. Man. <laughs> yeah, sure. For sure. Cause yeah. this is all news to me. Mm hmm yeah, so that's that's what I'm working on. That kind of that that had been a thing that had sort of been you know percolating and then kicked into high gear, uh, you know, not too long after after the Witchman Kickstarter. It feels like that's the way an authentic piece of work goes. Just in general, every single comic I've made, put pencil to paper to, the idea was already gestating for years, mm -hmm. literally years, man. Before I st I start to uh generate the actual comic pages it's it's almost like you know that's that's the test to figure out if it's worth the, the time uh -huh. you know like uh you know you don't want to get bored like you were talking about starting projects and then just kind of like letting them do their thing like uh the way that you can kind of mitigate that i found is that uh it's an idea that's just in the back of your head for a long 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 time and then at some point you just it bumps its way to the top of the to do pile. So, uh, yeah, the subconscious sense. mind or whatever is working on it the whole time. Totally. And, and, uh, so you do the initial Godzilla pitch and you probably, you know, it's not like it was being built for 30 years, even though maybe to some extent it was. I'm sure you're a fan. Yeah. You know, in a way it, it was because, yeah, I mean, I've been wanting to do a Godzilla comic my whole career. And even when I did Godland, 
I was bringing in ideas that had been part of this like lifelong ongoing Godzilla idea. And like in Godland, like the first issue of Godland, this like alien shows up. And, you know, if, if, if I were Toho, that alien would have been Godzilla showing yeah. up, but I'm not Toho. So I had to create my own alien. Right. Man, dude, you were sorely missed this this last little trip we we went to uh, Tokyo because we saw Godzilla minus one at the Toho Theater well. <laughs> with the giant Godzilla at the top. Nice. And uh, checking that flick out when it was brand new, like in that theater. Yeah. Uh, they they do it up fly because there, there's all kinds of um promotional materials like in the lobby that uh, are are super cool that they just don't do here. Cool mm -hmm. pamphlets and books and posters and junk like that. Uh, it was it was a pretty special thing, man. And yeah. uh, you 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 came to mind for sure. I felt privileged enough seeing it here because it's yeah. like one of those things where it's like, okay, I got a week to see this movie, and then it's totally. So, you know, and you saw both happen. rounds, right? You saw, saw the black both. and white one. Yeah, I saw the color one first, and then when it came back in black and white, I'm like, I want to see this movie again anyway. But yeah. in black and white, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, and so it didn't I, disappoint. I still haven't seen it in English, and and I really need to because uh, when when we saw it, I had a great time, and I, I fucking loved it. But obviously, there's some dialogue driven stuff uh, mm -hmm. in order for you to kind of understand the nuance and things. And uh, when you just visually watch it, like there are questions uh, because when you see that first Godzilla, you are like, did they have like several teams of uh, CGI artists working on these Godzillas? Because there's this Godzilla with the big arms, and like uh, you know, is that some crew in Denmark or something it working on that one? It had like the least amount of Godzilla that I've seen in a Godzilla movie. And and I wasn't I wasn't complaining. Usually sure. like that's my biggest complaint with a Godzilla movie if there's not enough Godzilla. Had the least amount. That is interesting to think how cuz there's some of this stuff that there's like no way you would have been able to guess from context. But a lot of the movie it feels a lot like a Chaplin movie. Like the the um you know sort of just like the normal people scenes feel like something out of a Charlie Chaplin movie. So I'm sure it did like the pantomime of it probably you know, communicated a lot. No, yeah, of course. Yeah, to totally, man. Uh, somebody in the chat has a pretty good question for you, man. Uh, that wasn't the one. Uh okay. <laughs> well, that's true, too. There is there is like a scene where it's like, oh, yeah, Godzilla has Jaws. Yeah, completely. Favorite Godzilla movie and comic? Well, I mean... You a Jet Jaguar guy? I love Jet Jaguar. I mean, for a long time, Godzilla versus Megalon was my favorite Godzilla movie and, and might still be, but yeah, the Jet, Jet Jaguar. And yeah, cause that was like the perfect one for me. And that was what I would have built off of, you know, back in like the nineties, if I got to make a Godzilla comic back then, I would have built off that one. Cause it, it's got, it's got it all. It's got like a superhero. It's got uh, a good monster. It's got bad monsters. Like it, it just has it all. Um, but so that's, that's one of them, but yeah, the newer ones, like I love um, Shin Godzilla and then I loved I love Godzilla minus one like that's a strong contender like like for ne for now it might be Shin Godzilla but maybe Godzilla minus one and then of course the original like the original right. and it was um, it was probably like in the nineties maybe even the late nineties it might have been like right before we met each other or something that like uh, America kind of got the original Godzilla because prior to that you'd have to get the the, uh, Burr, the yeah. Ironsides Godzilla, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the Perry Mason one. <laughs> yeah, Perry Mason Godzilla. So, and and that and that's a revelation. They're two completely different movies. Oh, totally. I mean, yeah. it's 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 complete. It's silly. Yeah, the, it's nonsense. And Perry yeah. Mason one, dude. Like, yeah, there's Godzilla, no God... reason to have all that extra stuff in there. King Kong versus Godzilla is another favorite too. And King Kong versus Godzilla, I haven't seen like the Japanese cut. I'd like to see that. I've only seen the American cut, and it's kind of the same as the Perry Mason one, where it's like the breaks come on so fast when it's like the stuff that's made for the American audience. It just like screeches to a halt. Right. Yeah. I wonder how that stuff worked out, man, because there, there was even, you know, we had, we would get, we would get plenty of Godzilla flicks and they would always be on the Turner stations, TBS, TNT. And uh, Ted Turner just couldn't help but fuck with stuff, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, adding weird songs and all kinds of, it's called, all kinds of weird shit, man. You know, it'd be fun, dude. Uh, at some point, Whenever you could join a Monday stream uh, and and uh, join the crew there with my homeboy Scheme Richards, he's a Philadelphia head and he okay. he, he was born in seventy, so so uh, it would be he, interesting yeah. to get you guys on the hook and 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 uh, you know talk some shit. Because... Well, for Godzilla, yeah, I think it was either like Channel Twenty Nine or Channel Seventeen, but that's when you'd have the Godzilla movies, and it was like the same the same voiceover guy who does 
like all the local commercials right. in Philadelphia would be like announcing like, you know, and I don't think it might have been part of Creature Double Feature. I'm not sure. But it was, you know, like those packages, those amazing like early 80s packages. Yeah. And, and he would talk about like, you know, you guys had anime uh, on UHF in, in Philadelphia, which uh, do, do you have any recollection of that stuff? I mean, I remember uh, like Speed Racer I, 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 and uh, Gotcha Man and, and you know, like th those kind of things. I don't. Right. I don't, I, yeah. I'm not sure what other stuff he's referring to. I know we had. Well, see, we he's had, old. He's yeah. old enough to have gotten um, Astro Boy type. Shit. Astro Boy, yeah, because yeah, he would be he would be old. Like, yeah, he's he's older, so he would probably know more of that stuff that like the older kids knew. But I know like the older kids would talk about. I mean, it's not animated, but would talk about Ultraman being right. on the TV, and I never saw Ultraman on on TV when I was a kid. Yeah, totally. So, so uh, with with this next project, uh, is is it going to secure you up for for a year? How how long do you anticipate you're going to be working on this thing? Yeah, I should be working on it. For, it's a it's a really relaxed schedule too. The schedule is great. Like it's it's super flexible and stuff. And I'm having a lot of fun with it. But yeah, it'll 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 secure me financially and uh, in terms of you know giving me something to like keep me out of trouble. Yeah, yeah, it's by by securing. I just I just meant time wise, man. Give you something to do because shit. I know I know that uh, I know that the Kirby book, I know that the Stan Lee book are out there. They're doing their thing, man. I I see I see those on a lot of people's mm -hmm. bookshelves and stuff. How many how many uh, languages are are those things in at this point? Do yeah, you... I mean, there, yeah, there was like a I think it was like a Brazilian one that that just came out, and yeah, it's it, yeah, they're they're in a bunch of languages, and um, and I saw like. I think the French edition of um, Fantastic Four Grand Design, like maybe just came out or something. Um, and then, um, and yeah, I'm, I, I'll bet that the way timing works. Uh -oh, I'll somebody's bet, watching Seinfeld again. Uh, uh, is it breaking uh, up? No, you're good. You're good. Okay. Yeah, no, you're good I'll, now. <laughs> I'll bet that it's a, there's a plane flying overhead. It might be that. I'll bet by the time I finish this Godzilla thing, like the they'll pro the publisher will probably be ready for like you know the 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 follow up to to the Jack Kirby and Stan Lee books you know you know like the Steve Ditko book or the Gil Kane book or you know whatever <laughs> it ends up being they'll probably be ready for it oh that's sick man like like is that is that something that uh, are you, are you joking or or would you go down well, that I mean, rabbit yeah, hole I'm again? I mean I'm I'm not yeah I don't I don't have any plans to do a Steve Ditko or a Gil Kane book I mean I'm I'm not averse to you know but some I'm, like because uh, 10 speed who, who published Jack Kirby and published, I am Stan. They're not, they're not looking for witch man or something like yeah. that. You know, they're looking for something that's a little more like, you know, something you could put in like libraries and you right. know, stuff like that. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting, man. Cause, cause like we, you know, we share the same agent and, and, uh, he, he went out and pounded the pavement and, and got a, got a good deal with a uh, switchblade and stuff. So yeah. Uh, the possibilities are out there, um, which is which is a pretty freaking cool thing. And I, and I'm sure even you know if you wanted to, I'm sure Image or somebody else would, would pick up that that Witch Man slack for you uh, at a later date when it comes to you know post fulfillment of of the Kickstarters when all, all the copies mm -hmm. go away. That's good. That's the the cool thing about this is um re really the the way to kind of make a, a career of this. You you have to be able to present the material to to every audience that that wants it. I mean that's that's the name of the game at this point. So if you could take a couple of bites of the apple selling old rope that's old to you but it's new to, you know, a different kind of audience who appreciates a different distribution mechanism, right? So you have your digital, you have your your uh Kickstarter stuff and you know there's just straight up weekend you know Wednesday warrior type people that would want to uh scoop that thing up. Uh it's we when we talked with uh Kelly Jones and Matt Wagner about the Dracula project, you know, like super wildly successful Kickstarter they put together with that. Afterwards, Jimmy and I were thinking like, we we're just talking off the record, like, man, like this thing could be in any number of languages. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's endless possibilities with, uh, with these projects, you know, and, and you've already developed a heck of a bibliography with, with foreign publishers and things. Uh, so I could see, Polish witch man and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's so empowering when you do this because for the longest time it's like, oh, I don't want to deal with that headache of you know putting together the PDF or whatever, you know, like and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But once you do it, it like you remember that oh, this is actually super easy. You know, it's a, it's just like a little bit of everything else is the hard part. You know, this right. is pretty easy. And then it's like 
yeah, I can, I don't have to like, you know, put it in front of anybody and say like, Hey, what do you think about this? I can just be like, okay, I want to do this. Let's right. do it. So it's, it's really I, like, I want to do another one. I mean, I don't, obviously I don't want to start another campaign until I've fulfilled this one, but that, that should be pretty soon. So. Well, I would I would suggest that you uh, coordinate with with a kayfabe a little bit, and uh, I bet you we could double or uh, triple the triple that the the ends that come your way, man. Yeah. Uh, it was just it was just bad timing. Like the 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 machine of cartoonist kayfabe has changed, man, since uh, uh -huh. since you've been here last, and and uh, uh, there's sort of more that goes into it and stuff, and we and we schedule ahead a little bit more, so it would be something that we you would need to prepare for a little bit. Like we can't just immediately yeah, say, I, oh I, yeah, let's yeah. do this. Yeah, because it was, and they were one after the other, uh, Jack Kirby and Witchman. And yeah, I don't think either of them got onto kayfabe. It was a little like uh, when- Stanley Gilbert got Gottfried, onto kayfabe? <laughs> oh, Stanley did, but yeah, Stanley, like those other two need kayfabe more, than, you know, because it's a little off the, off the, it's a little off the beaten path, but it was like uh, when Gilbert Gottfried did his uh, DVD, <laughs> And then Howard Stern went to satellite, like he wasn't on like free airwaves anymore. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> the, the time, yeah, it's just timing. Oh but yeah, yeah you talked about the next... Star Warriors thing. Well, listen, yeah, man, this... if you would have given Jimmy yeah. two, two copies, I there would have been a video the next week probably. <laughs> I don't know, Tom. Uh, well, I, I do know think you, I do think there's a magic of handing something to somebody in person too. So no, that's true. Well, by the by the time I had Star Warriors, it was too late. By the time I had Star Warriors, because it was like the the the, uh, the initial orders. I mean, it did well. Witchman did well, but without kayfabe, it's like I I know that kayfabe wouldn't have added zero to it. So, it, but yeah, yeah, I would say that we, they would significantly not. Man, go ask Michelle <laughs> Fife about last exactly. night. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I mean, maybe maybe this will if uh, Image has any leftover copies of Star Warriors, maybe this will help uh, clean them out. Right. Yeah, man. Uh, so, so what else has has been on the docket? Like, are you a uh, pencil to paper with this Godzilla? Or yeah, it's that... what I, it's what I do every day. Like, whenever I have a free moment. Well, how long I'm have you on... been working on this uh, at this point? Then I mean, like, seriously working on it. Probably. Uh, I mean, the Witchman thing ended in uh, October, so it, like it was probably a little. Yeah, maybe maybe since December. Since December, working. Like seriously. that's when they fired the starting pistol. That's when they and... said, "Yeah, let's let okay turn in the script." And uh, like, I love that process too, where it's like you do a script and then they're like, oh yeah, this is cool. Or, or even notes, like I love notes too. Cause like every, every pass it gets better. So like this Godzilla script, it's like the best, the best thing I've done so far. And yeah, like working on doing, I think I did over a hundred pages of Godzilla in, uh, you know, in my little, you know, just for fun Godzilla. So if you have a hundred some pages of Godzilla that you've done, you're now like an expert in making a Godzilla comic. So it's right. just flowing now. Like I, you know, that's, that's, that's your modus operandi, man. Like, yeah, that's how, that's how it worked with uh transformers GI Joe. I, I, re I remember those days, dude, when, uh, you know, they, you were in talks and then you just treated it like it was a go, you know, cause like mm -hmm. Hasbro had whatever their, list of things they needed to get done at any given time. And, you know, comic book approvals are like fucking way low on that list. So uh, it was like six months and you were fucking generating all these comics and all these ideas and stuff before they, they, you know, said, go ahead. And then you were just off to the races. I feel very like inspiring to see. I feel like there's room for that early stuff too. Like it's like, you know, can we publish that stuff too? Like, you know, and I feel like maybe down the line there is room for a like the art of Transformers versus GI Joe book, where it's like just all that preliminary stuff, you know, just like I mean, all that, you know, Kirk Kirkman could do that now, mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, he's he's got the license and stuff, and I'm sure he could do whatever he wants with with that material because that that was the whole thing. I was talking with those IDW dudes like way back in the day, and my thing was just like, man, I ain't doing nothing that that like I can't get royalties on and mm -hmm. and wh whatever else, and and they were like, you know, we can make a deal with you. And hook you up with royalties, but it would be through IDW. Like we, you right. know, we have to re-up this license every now and then. And and then, you know, if we don't re-up it, if somebody comes in on like an auction and outbids us, then you know, we, we that sort of ends our 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 wiggle room for for that part of it. You know, so like that kind of stuff is possible, but uh, it's yeah. definitely nerve wracking. Yeah. Um I think it prevents the the best of those kinds of comics, but but I think that uh, Kirkman's enough of a fanboy that, you know, he's got 
Daniel Warren Johnson doing tr Transformers comics. So he's he's got people with good pedigree doing this stuff. He's probably paying paying good loot to to make some cool shit happen. Yeah, you know what you're talking about with like the IDW thing. We sort of saw how that plays out with um, when Disney took over Star Wars because all of a sudden, like Disney wasn't paying out on deals that like Dark Horse had made. And mm. that, you know what I mean? Like, it was like, oh no, you know, fresh. Like there, there was a lot of, you know, there, there was a lot of, and, and I remember even like, um, like Neil Gaiman kind of came out and sort of spoke on behalf of the guy who wrote the first Star Wars novel, like the novelization of the first Star Wars movie. That guy was saying, Disney's telling me they don't, you know, that, that they have nothing to do with that deal that I made, you know, and, and eventually they did make it right. But it, it was so like, yeah, it's interesting when these things change hands. Yeah, with uh, with Kirkman having it, I mean, I, I, you know, anything could happen. Uh, it, it just Yo, looks Kirkman. like Kirkman. Kirkman, yeah. I know you're a watcher, dude. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, let's get the art of Transformers G.I. Joe, Tom Scioli, 100 extra pages of uh, cool artwork, including the mission. The I think one of your greatest victories was getting that uh, mission to find uh, Osama, Osama bin, bin Laden, Laden. comic. Yeah, it's in, in IDW published it with totally. Hasbro's approval. Um, I, I mean, yeah, that the the Transformers versus GI Joe Omnibus has been out of print for a while. It's one of those things that goes for like crazy prices on eBay and stuff. So yeah, that would be a natural and yeah, slide in some extra stuff. But I'm just thinking, I mean, and, and yeah, why not? Like, I'm just thinking with with Kirkman, they've got like so much product coming. Like they've got they've got all kinds of books coming out with that license. I imagine like they need to kind of like let that stuff run its course a little before they start digging into the back catalog. But who knows? Yeah. I think you're selling yourself short. Uh, okay. I, do, I, I know I know we have uh, enough people watching with six degrees of separation. Let's get Kirkman on the horn and uh, let's get a reprint of that Transformers G.I. Joe with uh, extra 200 pages of of uh, Tom's uh, sketchbook materials, man. Because I got to see that stuff in development. Yes. Me and Tom yep. would would, would uh, connect every week. We would go to a, the sushi shop and, and uh, get a good lunch. And I would see like the next round of pages. And man, I feel like it was like five notebooks that you – that you filled up yeah, of, of, of uh, sketches and, and uh, story ideas and pages. And, and there's a lot that hit the cutting room floor that did not make it into the book. Really, really cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. F yeah. Full stories and stuff. And um, I, I mean, same with superpowers, super, like the super, right. that that's the one I would really like is the superpowers art. Uh, Shioli's art of superpowers, because there's like years worth of stuff. That yeah. like, and, and I still mine some of that stuff. Occasionally, I'm working on something new, and then I dig something out from that that uh, you know superpowers pile. The, one more thing with the uh, Transformers versus GI Joe. In one of the issues, I tease um, a shipwreck mini series called Shipwreck Space Pirate that comes out in 2025. Now, this was back in like 2015 <laughs> that I teased that, so 2025 seemed like an impossibly distant future so yeah uh, again kirkman if you're listening uh 2025 is coming soon so so we got to get cracking on that that uh, <laughs> shipwreck space pirate mini series how about uh favorite godzilla comics i i i sort of know that you're the kind of guy to kind of go back and and uh reinvestigate a bunch of stuff uh did you did you do any of that man some of the trimpy stuff yeah or... i mean I, I've, I've read all the trimpy stuff um, and, and, you know, amass the collection. It's, it's a little hard to get a hold of, but although I see they're coming out with like an omnibus of that stuff, of the trimpy stuff. So that'll be cool. But yeah. Um, yeah, that stuff's good. And then there's like, how about there's that like the one... Steve Bissett, uh, there's, you know, Art Adams. There's remember the one, it was like, they changed the, the, the spiny shits, man. And it's a, it's a, um, it's a Ditko comic. Mm -hmm. And they call it something like Dr Dragon's Claw or something like that. It's, I think it's, yeah, it's Dragon, some Dragon Man or something, Dragon something. Yeah, but, and it's like and, a Marvel premiere or something. Somebody in the audience will, will know what that is, man. Uh, did you fuck with that one? I, yeah, I think it has a Frank Miller cover too. But yeah, it was like the Godzilla license ran out and they had this Ditko. I don't know if it was like a fill in or something, but they had this Ditko one. It was kind of like mystical and stuff. Right. And yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. that. I, I I am fascinated because you don't have to change Godzilla much to like make him like public domain. So, um, you know, I, I was watching uh, a lot of those like early Ultramans and it's it's Subaraya doing 
the the effects you know like that that's ultraman is his thing but he was like the effects guy for godzilla and so he still has the godzilla suit so there's like an episode of ultraman where it's godzilla with like an extra like <laughs> like an extra fin on his back but then during the fight ultraman rips that fin off uh, so now it's just like a bloody godzilla <laughs> that's that's funny man yeah, yeah that's super cool uh is the god is the gobots comic still in print I, oh no, GoBots is out of print, and I think that's like even more expensive. Like, and and those also, I think they like disappeared from like anybody who bought them digitally or whatever. You know, oh, like they, one of those like weird comicsology things or something. Yeah. So, I mean, and and I don't know for sure, but I assume that's part of the Transformers and GI Joe deal, but maybe that's not right. because oh yeah, Micronauts. Right. Because I think Marvel has Micronauts right now, so that's not so. I, so I guess all that Hasbro stuff isn't necessarily linked together but i'd um, assume gobots is you know that, that if kirkman wanted to make a gobots comic there's nothing stopping them it's it's funny how this stuff works man i uh, just using our own collections and when we make videos of of certain things uh taking for granted that the comics that that we have that we put underneath the microscope are like sometimes thousand dollar comics just yeah. because you know they're they're long out of print and they're like licensing issues. There was there was one video I had in mind to to do, uh, and I don't exactly know what to call it, and I don't even know if it would be successful for the channel or whatever. But if you were fucking with Tayo Matsumoto from day one, and you get like all the Viz reprints and shit, you, like you have two thousand dollars worth of comics, yeah. and it's totally inadvertent. It's just like because you dig weird cool looking manga that that doesn't you know look like the standard shonen stuff mm -hmm. and it's the same thing like to a t any of that kind of shit man when idw had had the rights for you know dick tracy and stuff like of course for a while like the flat top book out of print the license lapses 400 dollars book yeah yeah and and um the transformers versus gi joe book has lapsed into that and it is always shocking when like one of your books enters that category because it's like oh, that's yeah. not that that was like i think it came out in 2017 because it was like after the whole series was done they put out like the big hardcover and it was like get it while you can that's i mean that, that's how it is that's, with all my stuff it's like get it while rule. you can you yeah just, that's you that's the rule it. that's the rule that everybody kind of kind of needs to uh, subscribe to because that that is the way it is man i remember a long time ago you you said something like uh publishing is at this at the place it was in like the 1800s yeah but where the, just a yeah. couple thousand if you're lucky of, of things are being published yeah even like major releases are still like the numbers are very it, the numbers are what would have been a limited edition in you know the, the 70s or the 80s very shocking stuff like when whenever the first hip-hop hit the new york times bestseller list it sold out and it hit like seven on the list and what that first print run was it wasn't that much it wasn't yeah. what you think it should be, mm -hmm. and so, and so it's just like, man, there are that those very few people reading mm -hmm. in in this country, man. Very very few. Yeah, it's it's uh you know on a good day it's a niche. I mean you know like like again the numbers that it takes for something to be profitable, you know it's it you know it's exciting and it's great and stuff, but just looking at the global population, it's still pretty small. Yeah, very, very illuminating having that conversation with Eastman and Laird about uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja, Tur Ninja Turtles number eight, which was the most popular Mirage Studios Ninja Turtle comic at 135,000 copies, I think uh, Peter Laird said. That was before the cartoon came out. So before Turtle Mania and, and whatever else, uh, there was probably, I mean, I'm sure there were more, you know, Leonardo action figures than than comics then than 135,000 yeah you know what i mean so that, that's that's such an interesting phenomenon it's it's not far off from like you know i'm sure george foreman made way more money hustling grills that's than, what they say that's than, they than, say. than he did uh you know being in a boxing ring or whatever it's funny how that works yeah i mean you just picture i mean just those ninja turtle action figures are like showing up by the pallet load Right. And it's like if and if you want like the four turtles, they don't just send the store boxes of four turtles. They send them boxes of four turtles plus all the ancillary characters. So you got you know, you just gotta like kinda Yeah. Yeah, shit. I remember those days like 
at the end of uh, Masters of the Universe, you could go down the the um the the He Man aisle, and it would just be um Buzz off. <laughs> right. Like that would be the only character that would be there, man. And he's a cool character, but like that's the only one that, that they have left. But but I bring that up to just kind of illustrate that the niche of what comics, what main, what uh, direct market comics really is, mm -hmm. because you couldn't do any better in terms of promo for a for a for a comic you know you had a, a cartoon it's it's the stuff that mcfarland talked about in our first shoot interview where he talked about the four pillars you know he's toys movie a cartoon video game you know that was mm -hmm. like what he was chasing probably on the model of ninja turtles they had that but because they were such a niche you know direct market black and white comic hundred thirty five thousand was was the ceiling yeah. And so and so with that in mind, that can't that can't uh, make a independent creator like feel too good, you know, that like, OK, without all of that support, uh, you know, you're certainly not going to hit hit that unless you have something uh, very exceptional. Yeah. And that yeah, was for, fortunately, you don't have you don't have the baggage either. like so much. When I look at the history of mainstream comics. There's just so much sabotage going on. There's so much like destruction coming from in, you know, the caller is inside the house, you know, you hear about, <laughs> like, uh, like where it is. And, and I've even experienced a little bit of it myself, but yeah. where like, um, you know, it's like for a long time at DC during the silver age, it was like, you weren't allowed to use foreshortening in your artwork. <laughs> that was like an editorial edict. You know, it's like all this like shooting yourself in the foot kind of stuff. And it because it was always as a kid and stuff, it was like, how come comics aren't amazing? Like, and it's like, oh, they, they just need, they just need me, you know, like they just need somebody to come along who's going to make it me. But it's, it's actually, there's lots of people who are capable of making amazing comics. There's just this like whole structure in place to make sure that never happens. Oh, dude, in that Stan Lee documentary, what, one of the most illuminating pieces was from that 1970s show where Stan Lee, you know, it's like a magazine talk show. Stan Lee's on the dais with uh, Julie Schwartz and they have just, uh, you know, some random bumpkin ass uh, college kid who is extolling the virtues of Marvel and, uh, you know, Marvel, it's so progressive. It's so cool, blah, blah, blah. And Julie Schwartz is like ready to die on the hill. Jo Julie Schwartz being editor of uh, uh, at DC Comics, I, I guess at the time, uh, Superman titles maybe. And, uh, ready to die on the hill that uh, there's no educational value of comics. It's, it's just uh, entertainment for children. We're shooting for, you know, five, six year olds, seven year olds. Uh, you know, this is a, you know, Timmy's first uh, reading experience type, type work. Now this is your boss, you know, who's, who's, uh, who, who, who's from the top down. This is, this is the mandate. And uh, that's, that's, that's an uphill battle, you know, and, and that's where you have to bend the knee to, Neil Adams for for uh, chipping away at that a little bit because uh, you know Julie Schwartz like they they couldn't they couldn't argue with the aesthetic being so cool and shit like that you know and I know that there was like some fights about I think he was doing um I think he was doing Batman in the back of like I don't know Brave and Bold or something and that would have been somebody else's title and then you know Schwartz or whoever else was the Batman editor was like hey come over come over here and, and do some of that Batman over here. Like I remember mm -hmm. reading some stories like that. So you, so you had that situation, but then at a certain point, Schwartz had to acknowledge that uh, the times they are a changing because he was the editor of the, the um, two part Alan Moore joint with Kurt Swan. I think his name was in the credits, man. So uh, it's still, it's still Alan Moore playing with that kind of mythology. And it's definitely a lighter Alan Moore. This isn't, this isn't a watchman comic but uh it it is a little bit deeper has a little more depth than your typical your typical old school uh superman comic and 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 before him when uh mort weisinger when he, when he was the editor dude i uh went down this rabbit hole and accumulated all the um jim shooter sh stuff that he did as a teenager and mm -hmm. and you know his his entire uh bibliography for for uh dc when because just that that is such a cool idea right like that's yeah. it's a, it's a it's a dream story it's 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 what you and i probably uh you know dreamt of as, as as kids like you know i have all i have all the answers and he like had the opportunity at 14 to get get started with it 
Uh, but the Superman comics, you know, he introduced the Parasite character. Parasite, great, great comic. And it's like, you read all those Superman comics from that era, they're horse shit. Right. And then all of a sudden, there's this like threatening bad guy who's like a match for Superman who looks kind of cool. And, and it's like, you know, I want more of this. Totally. And it's it's fantastic because before that, you know, I have this stuff in order. So um, before that, Shooter's doing backups. Maybe it's Superboy stories that I forget, but he was doing stuff inside of Superman comics. And but he would just do like a backup. Maybe it was Supergirl. I, f I forget exactly what it was. The point is that there would be say three Superman stories in Action Comics or Superman or whatever it was at the time, and each of those comics takes place in a different time time zone. So like there's one Superman from 2000, another Superman from the year 3000. Mm -hmm. Not it, all of their names are like you know Clark Kent adjacent, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I didn't know about this shit. I'm like, this is no wonder they have to do like a crisis on infinite earths to get rid of um, all of that stuff because it really is horseshit. And just like when we were kids, like when I was a kid in the eighties and on the family channel, they would play the Adam West Batman uh, show with his ward, Dick Grayson. And then you get the um, Batman comics and like Dick Grayson's all grown up and has a weird blue costume and then there's like this revolving door of Robins, you know, Jason Todd and then uh, Tim Drake. And you're like, well, this ain't right. You know, this, this ain't the real shit. It felt like mm -hmm. it felt like a generic, you know, because like they're selling me this Bruce Wayne Dick Grayson thing. Well, that that was like the whole, you know, like Gen X experience or whatever it was. You have the baby boomers telling you how great all their stuff was and right. how, what shit your stuff is <laughs> <laughs> like i mean that's that's how i became a dick tracy head you know my when that movie was being teased my my pops was like telling me about all that stuff and and then uh they they brought back the cartoon mm -hmm. which probably could never come back i uh, i don't know how it came back the first i don't know how it got on the air to be, to be <laughs> <laughs> like 1990 was a good time because like there's not one skit from in, in living color that could probably uh, be played, <laughs> played on proper air anymore man so there was still there was still some edge to the um to the culture at, at that moment man but but like my pops really evangelized me on um dick tracy and and you know i i went deep down that rabbit hole but also like that that was uh when you know how everybody's got that kind of impotent rage whenever they change characters now or like uh, you make make this character a girl or whatever and we always mm -hmm. joke like it is funny that like every they they make all the characters gay and stuff but um when like in the 90s i remember old heads getting real mad that like will smith was uh wild wild west interesting it was, like, it was james garner i think in the i think it's called james 60s. arness no james what, uh, Ar james I, jim arness I, I thought James Garner was was the guy. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Rockford Files. I think he might oh, okay. have been Wild Wild West. Okay. Okay. Yeah, man. But like, yeah, like I remember hearing old people. Like it would be on TV where where they would talk about uh, how how crazy that is, man, and stuff. And I remember as a little kid, like, you guys are really crying about silly shit, man. You know. So like, when it, when it goes on now, we acknowledge it because it's funny. You know, like when we uh, we did a wizard issue where uh it's the wedding issue and i forget like how it even came up but i was like man you know if this was a 2024 comic like like batman would, i mean uh superman would be kissing his boyfriend uh for his matrimony vowels and stuff i i, I think that comic exists I, I do yeah like a lot of people showed up in the comments and they were like <laughs> Dude, you, you you say it in jest but it but it's out there man it's all it's all you know it's that stunt cast and shit like there there was a the time where where they would um get like a big name guy from outside of the culture so that would be like getting that dave morell dude who wrote the first blood novel get him to do a captain america or something and that that was like how they would sell shit i mean that that's, uh, that was kevin smith with with daredevil you know like that there was that era and it's just, it's the same deal as the julie schwartz stuff where the people at the top there's like such a fundamental lack of respect for the medium that uh they're and and they don't have any job security like julie schwartz is lucky that he got to spend a career at dc comics but like that is not that won't happen yeah. anymore so it's all about those like short bursts of success so like starting in the 90s man that, that was the move you well, know that, getting, that, getting harlan ellison to write a couple of things here and there 
that's the um, that's the Stan Lee quote is if you want to make it in comics, get famous in something else first. <laughs> and really, I mean, all it's not that like, I mean, you know, Harlan Ellison is great and all that stuff, but it's not like he had like some amazing skill set that like people in comics didn't have. It's just that it's a name when, recognition. Well, when somebody like him shows up, there's less interference. You know? I, I, yeah, I wonder. I wonder, man, because it's not like he wrote a million comics, you know, like I wonder if he was like, because who was it? Oh, yeah. Uh, we looked at the Mobius documentary and uh, Mobius was talking about the Marvel method and stuff. And he actually liked the Marvel method, mm -hmm. but uh, it would be the like editorial and it would be just other comics buyers who just were like, you know, had had no impact. It had zero impact at all, you know? It's like you get one of the greatest cartoonists ever to play around in this sandbox, and then the audience uh, didn't respond to it. You know, that was like one of those ways of stunt casting where you take like one of the best of comics and bring them into your space. And, and you know, his stuff was still circumscribed by, by Stan Lee, really. Like, it wasn't like Mobius. Mm -hmm. go, f go wild, you know? The most wild he went was with some of those pinups. That were like right, in the um yeah. yeah, there's like a Spider-Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super cool, dude. That I think that would I think that was the problem. Uh, I mean, not the problem. I mean that that uh, you know miniseries is is fine, but choosing Silver Surfer and Galactus, it's like you know nobody really cares. Like it's a perfect fit for Mobius, but I don't know that anybody can. But if he did Spider-Man or the X-Men, that's a different story, right? Yeah, totally, man. So with that in mind, uh, you know, Toho, they uh, they were salty on the on the first deal that you uh, that you sent their way. Can you talk about some of the things that they bristled at? Can you talk about that? Yeah. Like, has the story changed dramatically enough? Oh, that, it's, a uh, it's a completely different comic. I mean, that so, was like one. Yeah. So uh, like I know you to push the boundaries when it comes like when you get these properties you will push these things pretty far and make the editors do a little work, pay, pay, a, little <laughs> pay a little attention to, uh, to what you got going on. I mean, everything I do is in the name of making a great comic. I, I only, you know, so I'm going to do whatever it takes to make, make this thing as great as can be. But um, I mean, the thing, Toho liked what I was doing in general. There were just a couple things that I did that are like, we don't do that. Like we, we just like, we have policies that like, that's not done. And so again, that uh, that's that's what's great about doing <laughs> well, that first. And then, and my, can you say what any of those things? I, were, I can go down the list. But my Godzilla comic is published because I made a comic, yeah. and you can get it on my Patreon. And then I did a bunch of videos where I read it to you. So yeah. that first Godzilla comic is a comic. It's right. not it's not anything that I'm like getting paid for, but it exists as a comic. That's the beauty of this age we live in. So that's my first Godzilla comic. This is my second one, but no, it was just like in my Godzilla comic, which you'll see if, if you read it or check out those videos on the Total Recall show channel. Um, a, a big thing of it was I loved in Godzilla versus Megalon, how you have Jet Jaguar, how you have like Godzilla, but then you also have like this kind of superhero guy and he's like right. a robot. But again, like it could be a guy in there too. You know, it could be like Iron Man or something, but I mean, and so I wanted to make like a bunch of almost like an Avengers, like a bunch of superheroes that are part of this Godzilla universe, you know? And so, and so Jet Jaguar's there, so he's gonna be like the Iron Man guy. Uh, but then I created Manzilla, where it's it's kind of like Steve Rogers. Um, when Godzilla attacks and destroys like this guy's whole world, everything he cares about, his whole family and everything, he volunteers at this like, you know, anti-Godzilla, you know, uh, initiative that's going on. He volunteers to be experiment, have his body experimented on. And they had, they have like little cell samples of Godzilla and they're eject injecting people with them. And he's in line to do it. And he's seeing like a guy like, you know, die for, you know, burst into, you know, like, uh, uh, what's it like Akira kind of stuff, <laughs> you know, where like you like start, you get like your, your face inflates and with blood and then it sprays everything. So he's watching this as he's in line volunteering for this treatment and he gets injected like Steve Rogers with, you know, Godzilla juice and he becomes Manzilla. He becomes this like, you know, this like Godzilla. And so he's part of the crew too, you know? And so, so that, that one, they didn't let, they, they said, you know, like, we don't do that. Like, you, you, it, first of all, like, we don't, you know, want anybody like don't invent, you know, if you're going to invent like a new Kaiju or something like that, there's a process for that. But then also like that kind of thing, like a human being who gets the powers of Godzilla, that's just not like, you know, there's, there's a specific, you know, like, 
Um, so that 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 was the bit that was the thing that they cited. I don't think there was anything else in the pitch that they they just cited that and they said, like, we don't see how you can uh, take him out of the story and like it feels like the whole thing hinges on that. Now with so we're just going to reject the whole thing. Now, but no, knowing me, I can work with that. I can take Manzilla out of the equation, make this whole thing work even better, mate. You know, but. Again, so so that that ended that version, but you know the door was still open. They were still open to hearing other, other pitches, and then this this one you know came along. I love you, Tom. <laughs> I love you too, Ed. I love it so much, dude. You, you're so, <laughs> so imaginative. You know, like you would feel like that that's something that should have been explored, uh, you know, a million times by or or you know, fifty years ago. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. how all this stuff is, and and that's I mean that's what you do realize though the more time you spend in comics and working on properties is that there are procedures in place to prevent that from happening. Now, again, if I, you wanted, know, I, I mean, I think yeah. they were salty that they didn't invent that idea themselves, man. Well, also like, I mean, I'm more than willing to sign that away too. Like I wasn't going in there like, Hey, this is my invention and you guys better like empty your bank account. Like to me, that's all part of the, all part of the, th I'm making a comic for you. You're paying totally. me whatever. And, yeah. and, and again, I'm not, there are guys out there, who are like flawless illustrators who right. will deliver pictures that are, you know, just beautiful. And like, I'm not one of those guys, but I got this imagination that those guys don't have. So they're trading on that skill. I'm trading on, obviously I'm trading on, you know, my drawing skill and all that kind of stuff too. But I also have this other skill set that I think does like sort of set, set me apart. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely, man. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's so clear too. And, and on just another thing that you bring to uh, comics, especially when you're doing this work for higher stuff is uh, you are, you're generous. You're, you're extremely freaking generous with that imagination, you know, like very, very willing to just invent new stuff that, you know, and everybody knows that, you know, Toho could just run, run with, or Hasbro can just run with right. or any of that stuff. Uh oh, our guy. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, you know you, you you do it anyway in the spirit of making a good comic. Uh, that, like yeah, you, that's that's the name of the game. And just as like a reader, it's and, and also like look at your life. Like look at how fast time goes by and how fast your life goes by. And so what you're gonna spend your career sitting on your best ideas and maybe take them to your grave just because like you know you don't want to be you know Jack Kirby, uh, you know turn on the TV and the Hulk's on. And he's right. not getting, you know, like, like, and again, you know, I, I negotiate for the best deal I can get this and that, but I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sell sabotage my own work. <laughs> like I want, I want to make an awesome comic. And if I get, you know, and again, it was the same, like with um, Transformers versus GI Joe, I had a number in mind where I'm like, okay, there's, there might come a date where I'm sitting in a movie theater and I'm watching a movie and I see something that I wrote or drew or whatever fly across the screen. And my name won't be in it. I won't get a dime for it or whatever. What amount of money is going to make me feel okay with that when I see that in the theater? And I had a number and then like I got that number. And so, you know, it's like I, I made my bed and, and you know, I'll sleep in it. Yeah. Yeah. As, uh, as the great Howard Jake had said on the channel, you, you, you take the king's shilling willingly, man. <laughs> yeah. You know what it is. You know what the deal is, man. Uh, so if you could make peace with that, that, that is the crazy stuff whenever, you know, even the 80s dudes who, um, Tom, what's up with that phone? Dude? Is it about, I'm, the, I'm is, here. Is it about here. the cutout? I mean, if I disappear, it seems okay, uh, you know, but if, okay. if I disappear, but, it's but like, but like it was uh, the 80s guys, because like we're at that era now where, where, you know, they're mining, you know, Mark Grunewald, Captain America's and things yeah. like that for, for characters. And then uh, to see some of the, the artists and stuff come out and talk about like the deal. And it's like, you had fucking 25 years of history at that point. Now we have 50 years of history. It's like you know what it is man mm -hmm. like keep banging the drum all you want but but like if if kirby you know if it took him to get 50 years for the estate to get any kind of equitable deal that that probably is still a fraction of what he deserved yeah what the fuck are, are, do you think you're going to get yeah it's just i mean it's just uh you know part of uh you know being involved with a big corporation and on any level and you see it on every so you see it on the people who are like well established but you see it in other Fields too. And then, and then the one that blows my mind that we've been seeing lately 
is you make a movie and then they press the delete button for a tax write-off you know like, right yeah 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 that's such a new phenomenon yeah. right like uh yeah, yeah we were talking about that with um with wagner and that's you dc that's time warner that's that's that same that same company that you know uh effed over siegel and schuster you know it's it's so it's so interesting man and and uh the the more the more you deal with the 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 sort of the the mainstream stuff and um you know tomorrow morning we're we're going to be uh recording so so the king kayfabers who hop into the recording session they're going to see us go through a issue of wizard and uh there's in this one issue there's a uh an editorial piece by by jim shooter and this is now jim shooter the publisher of broadway comics or whatever the fuck you know mm -hmm. And he's talking about craft and like, we need to bring, bring craft, uh, craft back to the uh, medium of comics, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking, cause Broadway would be, that's like his third round of companies. You know, there was, there was, um, there was, uh, what do you call it, man? Valiant. Valiant. Yeah. Then there was Defiant mm -hmm. and then there's Broadway and you just had a Kickstarter. You know what it costs to print a comic, but he's getting funding from, you know, big willies like Broadway, like Broadway entertainment is Lorne Michaels, mm -hmm. you know? So that's so funny. Cause I, like, yeah, that didn't even compute, but yeah, Broadway, yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, it goes to show like what he probably is doing to like make these companies happen and come to fruition is he's selling a bunch of rich people on the potentiality of creating licensable properties. It's not about comics at all. You know, that's going to be sure. part of the conversation. It's going to, that's like in my notes for, for when we get to talking. Uh, Lord Michaels is not signing off on creating this company because he wants to have a, an amazing contribution to the medium of comics. You know, he wants to generate it's IP form shit, you know, yeah. once that wants to generate a whole bunch of uh, ideas that could then be, be us, you know, sold off to Hollywood. And, and it, it just so happens that the medium of comics at that level, it has, it's, it's this, uh, it's, it, it bypasses any of the Hollywood, uh, what do you call it, man? Like the, the, the unions. Well, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically scab. <laughs> I mean, I'm exactly. not, not, not talking about that specific, uh, endeavor but yeah it like if you it, yeah it's it's scabbing it's if you want to get around and and that has been comics forever because comics just never got a like unionized thing off the ground so it right. was kind of like oh if you want to sidestep that so uh if there's a strike on and you want to be able to keep writing scripts well you can write scripts for comics because that's not you know covered right or or just uh see see what the comic guys create and every now and then you might get a spider gwen out of the deal or something that yeah, you could uh, turn into t-shirts and the figures cheapest, and stuff that the cheapest r d imaginable but um uh you know there was an interview with lauren michaels and he tells this story it was like a very formative story for him where when he was starting saturday night live that like his boss was telling him i just want this thing on the air you know on time with sort of like a minimum level of craft if you want to make this thing good that's on you i don't care but that, that's entirely on you. And, and you know, I, th I think that's like maybe maybe the lesson he learned. And that is like, that that's what this machine's looking for. So they're not looking for like a good comic or whatever. They're just, right. you know, that's that, that would be nice if that happened, but that's not essential to the deal. Yeah, no. So that, and, and so it falls to people like us. Like it, it falls to the creatives who can, like we have our personal standards, our personal aesthetic standards, our professional standards. Uh, but yeah, for me, it's largely just as, like, I want to make a great comic and I don't right. care if I'm getting paid, uh, you know, $25 a page or a thousand dollars a page or whatever. Like I want to make a great comic. And if this is, you know, where I find myself, if this is the little desk I find myself at, then this is where I'm, I'm going to do my, like that, that was the lesson of comics because nobody was looking for anything from comics when Jack Kirby was working in comics. And nobody was looking for anything. And those guys mm -hmm. just purely from their own volition, like a young Steve Ditko who loved Batman and wanted to make like the ultimate, you know, what he, what he thinks a Batman style comic should be. Like that's, that's, that's where all this great stuff comes from. Right. Yeah, totally. And, and uh, one of the, 
things that I plan on doing with this channel is, you know, the people who come through the channel, who I interview, or I speak with, uh, it's going to reflect th that love for the medium. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. uh, people who, who are pounding the pavement, getting pages under their belt, uh, keeping the head down and just make, making the comics that, that they wanted to make. It's a really, really uh, fascinating thing to look at in, in retrospect when we go through these wizards and stuff and you see a Palmer's picks and you see, or like when we would have Seth come through and do a shoot interview with him and have the ability to ask him, like, how the fuck did you live in the nineties? Like, how was that even possible, man? And, you know, he revealed that he had a pretty robust illustration career to, to, to make comics happen and that it was never a profitable enterprise for, for at least a very, very long time. So these are people making, contributing to the culture in a massive way and they really broke down those doors you know because it's just more acceptable now there's more people reading that stuff uh to to a certain like there's there's comics for everybody people are finding their comics but that's a lot of a lot of that work was done by by like the first generation fantagraphics dudes first generation drawn and quarterly guys and girls who were um making those comics for 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 no financial rewards, man. It probably even caused, caused trouble in their personal lives, you know, to be spending <laughs> so much time making these things and, and, you know, maybe not being able to pay the rent with, with all this stuff that you're doing. It's like extremely elaborate hobby. I, th I think that, uh, that Seth might've even used those exact words when we were talking where it had to be treated as such because it just wasn't generating the loot. You well, know. I mean, Klaus was saying you you just you didn't need that much money to live back then. You know, you could you know, hundred fifty bucks pays your rent for the month. You know, right? Yeah. See, I don't know, man. Like, uh, like you, you, uh, you're older than me, man. So you would have a better sense. Well, of, I mean, uh, what my rent and stuff for my rent. Like, I'm I'm younger than those guys. Yeah. But my rent for the longest time was like three hundred dollars a month. So. That's so awesome. <laughs> You know that that's 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 how that's how you can you know be a comics guy in Pittsburgh in you know Pittsburgh's an easy place to yeah. uh, to, uh, to kind of prosper as an artist. You know, like I, I don't want to put that out there all that much, but right. we all we all own our homes, so, so yeah. Like, I mean, it's, uh, they're not gonna it's changed. Fuck up our, I mean, it's changing. The 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 venture capitalists and stuff have have discovered Pittsburgh and are are slowly picking it apart piece by piece. So. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Like when, whenever you see that uh, your town is on, uh, uh, you know, number one on a top 10 list of, uh, you know, what do they call it, man? Uh, most livable city. Most livable. Or, when or... I, when I came to Pittsburgh, it was that like a couple years before I came to Pittsburgh, it was like, you know, people would say, Oh, it's number two, the most livable city in the world is Pittsburgh. And then, ah, ha, ha, you know, people would laugh at it and stuff. And so then that's, that's the Pittsburgh I came to was the number two livable. And it's, it's, uh, it's grown from there. Totally. And, and, you know, it's had a couple of rounds of that and, you know, it's enough time has passed that you, you realize that, that that's, that's all, it's all kayfabe, you know, it's all planted information that uh, you get these developers who buy ad space and, and magazines and, and, you know, websites and, and have uh, publicists who are setting this up after they're buying up like acreage and all yeah. kinds of buildings and stuff. It's a real, it's a real interesting grift, but you know, we're pretty much from here. I always joke that uh, in a town of 300,000 people, you, me, Jim Rugg, there's a one in 100,000 or a <laughs> cartoonists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. How many, how many cartoonists does, yeah. New York or someplace have. <laughs> Yeah, man. Um, so, yeah. yeah, just I, I mean, bef before we wrap up or anything, I just yes. uh, I don't know if you guys have talked about Ramona Fraden yet. You know what? I'm so glad you brought that up, man, because you you were talking about uh, you were talking about something. And I, I meant to bring bring her up, dude. Uh, rest in peace. She gets the 10 bell salute for cartoonist kayfabe. Uh, it was man, maybe just last week or the week before where Cat Seal Comics had to make an announcement that I think 97 year old Ramona Fredon had to retire. She's not going to be doing commissions mm -hmm. any longer. So yeah. this lady was put in that pencil to the page up until the final moment, man. I saw a lot of people posting their like drawings, like really nice drawings of Aquaman, you know, and st you know, stuff that, that they got from with like dates of yeah. like, you know, 2019 or what, you know, like recent dates. So I guess that was, uh, you know, that's, 
that's uh, part of your like retirement, you know, or in, in comics, it's like you can you can you know, bat some of those out. Yeah, so I mean, certainly if you if you were just doing that work for hire stuff, man. Uh, yeah, I meant to bring her up whenever you were talking about your super friend stuff mm -hmm. or or uh, your um super yeah, superpowers. Yeah, because I I mean I, you know, I'm looking for whatever I could. I my research process, you know. So yeah. when I was doing superpowers, I'm like, okay, super superpowers evolves out of super friends. So let me get these. So I have stacks of uh you know of ramona Fraden's um uh super friends comics and again it's like there, there aren't too many comics you can read about the wonder twins if you're looking for wonder twin ideas and there is so much great stuff there and the superpowers is kind of like the big what if of my career because i had so much stuff ready to go and the plug gets pulled on it like so early but like there's so many great characters in her run that i was pulling from um and you know all this stuff, and and one of them, which I tried to pitch as its own thing, like after superpowers, but she had like there was this one story where it's like this, um, it's almost like it, it's all these like uh, monsters, it's like Dracula and stuff like that, but they're like a super team, and so I was pitching a monster society of America where it would be like instead of Batman, it's like Dracula, and so, you know, it, but it all all like from her her run, but yeah, great stuff, and then yeah, like the. The Aquaman stuff is great and stuff. But then talking about the uh, Jim Shooter, you know, Superman meets the Parasite and, so, and how that stands out among like the Superman of the, the era when you get a Jim Shooter. Um, Metamorpho was like that too. Metaphor, Metamorpho was one of those comics that it's like, okay, here's something good. Here's something I can read. Here's something. Right. And, and it, it builds its world, you know, little by little. It's a great looking character to begin with right off the bat. But then it's got a continuity. It's got a world that's interesting. It's like one of those weird little corners of comics where you have a little bit of space to make something cool. If it were Batman or it were Superman, you'd have way too many cooks in the kitchen. Right. You, you know. Yeah, it's yeah, it's incredible. I, I would scoop up those Super Friends comics at the flea market when I was a kid. And I had the option to also get like some Sikowski, um Justice League of Americas. Mm -hmm. And I would go for those, you mm -hmm. know, like her style was so clean yeah, and attractive, you know, like Sikowski was still working in that like standard kind of DC house style where it's that uh, almost clip art with, mm -hmm. but with like superhero costumes kind of style. But her stuff had some flavor to it, you know, some bounce, uh, good facial expressions on the characters. Um, some of well, those you know, it, it is it kind of hits some of the notes that manga does like some uh, and, and there's one of the Mon Ben episodes I forget whose episode it is but there's one where like one of the guys is saying like my career didn't really take off until I started giving the characters big eyes like once I started giving the characters big eyes and there is something about like cartooning where it's like if you do these like eight head tall people with like small faces there's no room for expression but then if you if you sort of cartoon the face a little bit every panel becomes a close-up every panel you get expression and ramona Fraden had that she had the um you know the superhero proportions and things that like you need to work at dc in the 60s and 70s and stuff but then the faces would have like a little bit of you know casper the friendly ghost or like a little bit of cartoon expression it's it's just like a really I, I, it's a winning formula, I would say. Yeah, totally. I could start to off the top of my head, like as you as you illustrate that, like I could start to think of all of the um, other outliers who would be even in this. Like J. Scott Campbell comes to mind, right? Like being in like a Jim Lee studio system, where like they're all doing the Gilbert want to be Jim Lee stuff, and he was consigned to doing that for an issue or two, maybe maybe over top of Jim Jim Lee roughs or something. But then he would had those big eyes and he would start to twist up their faces and add uh add uh, expression he brought a lot of other things uh to, mm -hmm. to the table also but but uh that's it's sort of that thing that's what um, i think michael golden had i think that's what absolutely. made him stand out yeah absolutely where like every every panel is a close-up and even like you look at bucky o'hare and it's like these star wars style um dog fights in space but then there's like a big duck head sticking out of the spaceship so like it, it would be like if you could see luke skywalker's face or, or han solo's face while he's flying the millennium falcon you know so you get you get that that cool long shot but then you also get a close-up right in the same drawing yeah i'm so glad you brought up uh, Ram ramona because uh we absolutely should have uh, should acknowledge her and her her contribution uh she she floated around at, at like maybe three or four co conventions that we did 
very recently. I think I think she would be a staple at the at uh, Baltimore, if if I'm not uh, mistaken. Did you uh, ever so cross paths with? I've never met I've, her, but yeah, I, I didn't say anything to her, man. But it was one of those things, man, where you're just very happy to know that she's there, yeah. and has a big uh, line at her table, and is uh, consistently busy. Um, yeah, incredible. And then and then dudes like um like Jaime's a fan of hers and stuff. You mm -hmm. know the 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 bros are uh, Ramona Fredo and fans. Yeah, you can you can see the line. You know, you can see a straight line from from there to there. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, totally. I mean. Uh, you know, like those Metamorpho comics are like take away the costume, and it is kind of like a love and rock. It's kind of because it is about like you know pretty girls and and you know just having fun, you know, uh, hanging out at the beach or something. You know, yeah. When ha when Jaime goes superhero, like he's channeling Ramona Fredo mm -hmm. for sure, man. Dude, let the people know what your social media is. Let the people know when to expect Witch Man, and and we could call it a night. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Um, on Twitter at Tom Scholey, on Instagram at Tom underscore Scholey. I have my Patreon, just search my name, Tom Scholey. And um, Witchman, uh, backers of the Witchman campaign should be expecting their, their comic uh, uh, in June, maybe earlier. And um, be on the lookout for Godzilla in you know fall of 2024. It's rapidly approaching, man. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, I just want to let everybody know that the, that the new uh, Red Room trade is is out there, man. It just came out today, man. So, so scoop that thing up, uh, and uh, dude, let's call it a night for all That's the uh, for all the kayfabers out there. Jimmy and I are going to be up bright and early, uh, 10 a.m. We're going to do a weekly session, and then uh, for the King kayfabers who are on, on our Patreon, probably 12:30 uh, is when the private stream is going to. Uh, pop up for for you guys uh, because we're going to have a shoot interview scheduled at 11, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, but noon British <laughs> British Virgin Islands time. Oh, nice. Okay, I was wondering how you get some of these guys up early, but I guess it's not like having like a rock star on the show or something like a cartoonist. They you know if you find guys who have interesting hours, but yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> it will not be a, uh, a a cartoonist, but it'll be a very important. Uh, very cool. create creator and uh it'll be a, a fantastic conversation that's that's a long time coming and i think uh it will be some good food for thought for for the makers out there so that's just a little tease the king k favors will find out who it is whenever we start up a recording stream but uh everybody go get some some z's have a have a have a good night and me and jimmy are going to be uh up and at them pretty early in the morning take care everybody we'll see you Okay, favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. We are on the road to 100,000 subscribers. Thank you very much. And if you get anything out of these videos, if you dig what we produce, make sure that you follow the channel and uh, it helps us out a lot. The videos are ultimately brought to you by the books that we make, but we have a Patreon, and the Patreon is there for you to mitigate the kayfabe effect, become one of our biggest supporters, and you get all the videos before anybody else. You also uh, have access to the live stream recording session as we produce these videos. Link in the description below for uh, the, the Patreon. We have more than 1,700 videos out there, and we might have talked about some of your favorite comics so make sure you hit the magnifying glass on the front page of the kayfabe youtube channel check out the channel pop in your favorite titles check out those episodes if we haven't talked about your favorite comics then by all means put something in the comments so that we can push those books a little bit higher on our uh to read piles ultimately the videos are brought to you by the books that we make right now i've been working on switchblade shorties which is my daily comic strip you could find it on all of our social media platforms the kayfabe stuff uh, my own personal uh, social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram. There's a dedicated Switchblade Shorties Instagram, and it's also uh, on Webtoon in its uh, full archive. The Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is uh, is going quick, and uh, it is 45 bucks on Amazon at the moment. Uh, so scoop it up if you haven't. Uh, it's almost freaking half off, so you can't beat that with a stick. Best book I made to date, X-Men Grand Design Trilogy Trade Paperback. Contains all of my X Men Grand Design works. Uh, it's the one place where you can get it all inside of one handy dandy cover. Red Room Crypto Killers is coming out at the end of February, part of a trilogy of trade paperbacks, uh, but you don't need to start with the first one because each contains four self contained stories. So if you grab this first, Crypto Killers, 
then uh, at a later time you can read the Antisocial Network or Trigger Warnings. Jimmy, why don't you let the people know what's out there? I have Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, and Street Angel, Princess of Poverty, both available right now from Image Comics. These are also self-contained totally. One is black and white, one is full color. Uh, the Homeless Ninja on a Skateboard, perfect for the action comics or superhero comics fan in your life. The big news for me is the self-published comics, True Crime Funnies, the 1986 zine, and the BW zine, celebrating the 80s black and white explosion. These are self-published. You can get them on my website, jimrug.com, or my Patreon, patreon.com slash jimrug. They've been out of print and unavailable. They will be back and available March 6th. So if you missed those, March 6th, you can pick those up. And Hulk Grand Design, this is a treasury-sized edition, out of print. However, the trade paperback coming out in May this year, and that is available now for pre-order. So let Marvel know they need to keep these things in print by pre-ordering that one wherever you pre-order books. The books are the most important way to kind of keep things uh, on, on, the, on the tracks. But there are some direct ways to support Cartoonist Kayfabe. Jimmy, let the people know. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. There you have it. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, support the channel, keep the vids rocking. Jimmy, give them final marching orders, and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.